Hello everyone, this is Steven Nojiri, taking a break from my retirement, not, um, don't worry some guy, I know some people may have heard that and got upset, uh, I know every, there's a lot of people still looking for that Kusunoki meme, so don't worry, it's not a, it's not a true retirement, uh, it's a prolonged absence, so to speak, uh, not, Anyway, um, the point is, is I recently watched a video from Anthony Cummins talking about the Shinobi Kiden and Gumpo Joshu putting uh, the Hattori documents to, or the Hattori material to 1560. So, the video was solid. I have nothing negative to say about the video. There's, there's nothing wrong there. And so this video actually, so let's make this clear from the very beginning. This video is not criticism video. So, if you were expecting a criticism video, unfortunately, so, this video is actually just to continue off of his, to piggyback, so to speak, off of his video. The, the, the argument that he put forward is fairly solid. So, uh, you need to just go ahead and watch his video. So, once you've watched Anthony Cohen's video, which, uh, if I'm competent, there should be a link somewhere in the description below. Otherwise, um, you just pretty much go to Anthony Cohen's channel and watch it. So... Once you've watched that video, the the first thing we need to discuss is, one, what he actually said. Two, we need to refine our understanding to make sure that there's no mistakes. And these run concurrently. I will sum up what he said here with a correct, hopefully refined, and then I'll touch on possible mistakes. So what he said is that you have the Shinobi Hidden documents. And it's important to understand that the Shinobi Hidden documents, the Ness, it's not a single document. It's a collection of documents. This is critically important. So many people reference the Shinobi Eden as a single document. It is a collection of documents. They, there are freestanding, independent documents that don't intrinsically go together. They have been put together to create a collection called the Shinobi Eden. You will find this a lot. There are many Gunpo manuals that are, you know, just Gumpo manuals, Heiho manuals, just there's many manuals that are actually a collection of several smaller manuals. In Kusuno Kiru, for example, we find the same thing. There are many collections of manuals. And Western historians and Japanese historians have made the mistake of assuming that just because they are all in one collection, that the date of the documents is the date of the collection, or that the date of the documents, you know, is the date of the youngest document in the collection. This is uh, this is an obvious mistake. When you're looking at it from far back, it seems very obvious. You don't date the whole collection. You date the collection, but you don't date each document to the date of the collection. But people make this mistake. So a lot of people have made the mistake of instantly just assuming that all of the Shinobi Eden documents are dated 1655 or 1725, whatever, you know, because of the fact that some of them come from that time. But it's very, very common for there to be collections of documents that span a hundred years, and they're all collected into one final edit at some point later in the Edo period. So this is the first critical point to understand. The Shinobi Hiden is a collection of documents. Within the collection of documents, we have things from 1655, et cetera, et cetera. We're not looking at those. What we're looking at is the documents that are dated 1560. Now, now that we've said that, you can know right away we're only looking at two documents. There's only two documents that I'm aware of in there. Um, I don't, uh, without dive, without me stopping the video and going into looking at the Shinobi Eden, it's my understanding that there's two documents in there that are dated 1560. This is gonna come up, this is also critically important. So the, what you have to do from here, from right at this point, you have to only focus on the documents that are assigned 1560. Every other document in the collection put to the side not part of this discussion. So you have these 1560 documents from, uh, from Hattori Hanzo. Now, there are some people that want to say that the documents are inauthentic, but uh, like Anthony said, as of present, I have heard no compelling argument as to why the documents are not authentic. Uh, the, the arguments are really weak and not very academic at all, and they're essentially, like he said in the video, certain professors or certain researchers just don't want to believe that the document could exist. 
But anybody who has an academic background knows that that doesn't mean anything. You don't want something to be real. It doesn't count. So therefore, until somebody puts out an extremely thorough and proper academic explanation as to why the documents cannot possibly be from 15 CE, which no one has done yet, we assume that the documentation is from 1560. In other words, the document says 1560. Nobody has presented good, solid, irrefutable evidence as to why 1560 cannot be an accurate date. Therefore, we, run, we go with 1560. The burden of proof that a document is fake or that a document is not from when it is signed, the burden of proof falls on the person making the claim. So if I find a document that says 1560, somebody says that can't possibly be real, it, the burden of proof falls on them to irrefutably prove that the document can't be real. They can't have a theory. They can't have a belief or a feeling. They can't have circumstantial evidence. It must be, if you're going to negate the date and signature and origin of a document, you mu it must be irrefutable. Nobody has done that yet. So in proper academic procedure, because no one has refuted that date, authentically refuted that date, we assume we work with the date of 1560. So we have two documents from 1560, signed by Hattori Hanzo 1560. This is fine. There is nothing wrong with that. 1560 is Okehazama, so it's very interesting. Uh, I don't know if the date, like the actual date is written on there, like the, the month and the day, because it would be very interesting to know if this was written pre or post Okehazama. But I don't believe the actual day is recorded on there. And again, maybe I'm wrong. I don't have it in front of me, but I know 1560 is Okehazama. So this is, this is a very interesting to me. Okay, so... Uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So the next part is we have the Gumpo Jiosh. And again, we have the issue, we have a problem here of people assuming that the publishing date is 1619 because of the timing of the collection. But Anthony has already proven academically and authentically and correctly by all academic process that the date is 1612 or before. So, but the date of the Gumpo Jiosh isn't even what we're looking at. What we're looking at is the fact that the art, the, uh, the, the writer, the author of the Gumpo Jiosh says that he gets his shinobi material from a hattori and that the hattori was in the service of takira and then we have to look at the timeline and like he explains in the video so i won't go into it too much but as he explains in the video that timeline puts this hattori operating roughly at the same time that hattori hanzo would be operating and writing the his nenpidem document of course, he wouldn't be calling it the Ninpidin documents, per se. You know, it would just be the things that he's writing. But they would become later part of the Ninpidin collection, or the Shinobi Hidden collection. So as his video explained, we have two independent documentations saying that the Hattori are using Shinobi arts in the 1560s. This is critically important because, again, these, are two in, these, are, these two are independent of each other, and they're saying the same thing. They're corroborating the story without being from the same source. This is, this is an important marker. The other important marker that we have is the fact that, now here's the critical part. Okay, so that's the first thing you have to understand from the videos is that we have, uh, we have compelling corroborating evidence. Okay, so what's next? Point number two then is the fact that when he says this is the first recorded ninjutsu, he's not saying that this is the first example of a shinobi. What he is saying is this, the 1560 documents are the first time that somebody has sat down and wrote a ninja-only manual. So that means in 1560, Hattori Hanzo sat down and the first time in recorded history, you have to remember there's prehistory, which means no one wrote it down, and then there's history, right? So this is critical to understand. We're not like I, Anthony and I, Anthony in his video, me in my video, it is not being said that ninjutsu didn't exist prior to 1560 or that no, there weren't shinobis before then, because, and I'll get to point three about why that would be impossible. But what, what is being said here 
is that 1560 is the first time that somebody sat down and may and wrote a document that is only about shinobi things. It is a collection of techniques. It is a collection of tools. It is a body of knowledge that is specifically just ninja or shinobi. Just shinobi. It, so this, the, the shinobi, Hattori Hanzo's 1560s shinobi hidden documents, not the entire shinobi hidden, 1560 documents are the oldest collection of techniques that is that is labeled shinobi everything in there is a, is a technique that is related to shinobi this is the first time somebody has said this is shinobi arts and here is a collection of just shinobi arts now let me move on to the point number three is going from that this does not mean you do not see references to shinobi in other documentation but this is only the first time that somebody has got a collection of techniques that they're calling shinobi arts these this is a shinobi manual that is the first book in recorded history that says this is shinobi manual all the other references to shinobi before that always mention shinobi they might have a couple of shinobi teachings but they're not a collection of teachings they're just like one or two tidbits of, of teaching they you they're either historical text which mention which cite the usage of shinobi or they are a, a proto gunpo manual that says something like you should have shinobi do xyz but nowhere before 1560 that anyone has found yet is there a manual that is an actual manual with tools and teachings that are all specifically shinobi tools and shinobi teachings? So that is why the 1560 documents are important because we find the first collection of material that calls itself shinobi material. I myself in my Kusunoki research, my Kusunoki research, I have dozens Dozens of manuals, dozens of history books, dozens of diaries, dozens of, of accounts that talk about espionage and sabotage, sometimes, and sometimes even using the word shinobi, the, 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 the actual kanji for shinobi, not yato or seto, no, shinobi, blade and heart, shinobi. But it never has teachings, or if it has teachings, they are just a, a couple of tidbits about the view of infiltrating or the view of spying. Nowhere is there a collection of, these are the techniques of a shinobi. Here's 15 ninja techniques to create a system. Nowhere does that appear before 1560. So let's be very clear about this again. 1560 is the first collection of techniques organized into a system that is called shinobi arts. Prior to that, Everything that mentions Shinobi is either a history reference, like on this day, so-and-so sent a Shinobi to do this, or they are, if you need to do this, then you should send Shinobi, or it's something like, when you send your Shinobi, make sure they do X, Y, Z, but it's always within a proto gunpo system, or it's within a sort of a historical record. At no point is it a teaching manual, or is it a collection of, of techniques. Like I said, again, the and, uh, we can go back to the Taiheiki, for example. Uh, now, the thing about the Taiheiki, you have to understand. Let me just, let me go off on a tangent here. The Taiheiki is something that people misunderstand greatly. A lot of Japanese misunderstand it as well. The Taiheiki isn't a single document. It's, the Taiheiki should actually be referred to as the Taiheiki documents with an S. The history of the Taiheiki proves, shows this clearly. We, can, we know that the original version of the Taiheiki was only 30 volumes long, and it was presented to the Ashikaga before the, Nor the Nanboku Cho was finished. So the original 30 volumes don't even cover the entire Nanboku Cho. And we know that Ashi the Ashikaga demanded that the volumes be edited. There's an entire issue with volume 22 being completely removed and it's not, and, and volume 22 doesn't appear until hundreds of years later. 
Um, we also know, for example, the oldest copy of the Taiheiki, we, uh, or the, the oldest copy of a Taiheiki document, because there are, there are a handful of documents. In other words, you have two types of Taiheiki document. You have what's called the, the sort of the, the mass circulation Taiheiki documents, which started in the Edo period. And that is where they were woodblocked and just printed. Right? And they became mass circulated, mass circulation. Prior to the Edo period, you had what's called the old style Taiheiki documents, in which those documents are, every one is different from the other one. They are close, but they are different. So this version of the Taiheiki, this version of the Taiheiki, this one has 40 volumes, this one has 30 volumes, this one has 35 volumes. This one says something a little different than this one. This one says something a little different than this one. So there is actually no single document that you can point to and call it, that is the Taiheiki. All you can do is point to a collection of versions and say, these are the Taiheiki documents. So see, a lot of people don't know that. They think that there is like one master version of the Taiheiki, and there is not. There's only a collection of documents that are fairly similar, but they all have slightly different information. So why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up, though, because one thing they all seem to have in common is they all seem to have the existence of shinobi in them. Shinobi appears in the Taiheiki twice, in, or not twice, but in two ways. One way is it means it is used as a verb to when people secretly escape. For example, when Kusunoki Masashige uh, escapes the fall of uh, Akasaka Castle the first time, right? And he does the whole thing where he sets the bodies on fire and makes it look like they all killed themselves. The first time that that happens, when he's and him and his men sneak out of the castle, all every version of the Taiheiki I've, I've looked at, they all say that he shinobied out. So in this case, shinobi means covertly escaped. But we also see it pop up as a verb in a couple places. When you're escaping, it's a verb or sorry, as a noun, and so when, it's, when you're escaping, it's clearly a verb, and it has nothing to do really with anything ninja, but you see a proto-ninja sort of thing popping up in the Taiheiki when it's used as a noun, when somebody is sneaking into a building in order to sabotage the building, they are referred to as a shinobi. And so this there's, a, there's some controversy over whether it's an adjective or a verb, but within the context, it really looks like a, a noun. And the reason it looks like a noun is because there's a couple places where clearly the noun has a descriptor attached to it, right? So for example, uh, there's no verb markers and it's just an adjective, you know, it's a descriptor to a noun. So the skillful shinobi. It doesn't say he skillfully shinobied in, it just says skillful shinobi, and there's no verb markers, right? So, I mean, like, there's really no other way to read it other than skillful shinobi. Um, but it doesn't say shinobi no mono or anything like that. And this is important, though, because I'll just go ahead and let you guys know. In, a, in many of the old documents, like from 1300 and 1400, shinobi is a single kind of character. It's just a single character. So uh, it's not shinobi no mono or anything. It's just shinobi. It's one character. Right? So, uh, but this is important though because we, we, that's not the, so in this context, shinobi always means either secretly sneaking out or sneaking in to burn something down. Prior to 1560, every time we see the word shinobi, whether it's a noun or it's a adjective to something else like a shinobi something it's always related to infiltration and it almost always is related to sabotage so what we find what we have we have a very interesting thing here where uh, in antiquity with, with in other words pre-1560 we have documentation of spies and saboteurs but there's different names for everything so anyway, so what I'm rambling on here, what, the reason I'm rambling on here is what I'm trying to get you to understand is that prior to 1560, there is a lot of documentation of the word shinobi as a verb and as an adjective and as a noun. And there are plenty, 
plenty of references of spies and saboteurs and agents and double agents and all of these stories. And we also find, and like I said, um, the word shinobi originally usually only is referenced as sneaking out of a place or as sabotaging something. But that's in the 1300s. But then in the 1400s, the late 1400s, we start to see the word shinobi pop up either as some kind of adjective or proper noun. And it's referring specifically, it's still referring to infiltrators and saboteurs, but it also starts to refer to spies. And then we start to see in the 1500s, it starts to, it starts to also mean spy. So by the 1500s, we can clearly clock Shinobi as being a spy and or a saboteur, but we don't have any specific art or collection of techniques in the historical record of the, of the skills or any kind of body of knowledge until 1560 with the Hattori Hanzo document that says these are the skills of Shinobi. Boom. So in a wrap up of that, 1560 appears to be the first time that somebody sat down and recorded a body of knowledge as, a, as the ninja arts, a body of knowledge specifically for Shinobi. Two document, uh, the, the, there's two documents in the Shinobi Heaton collection that co correspond, that corroborate this. There's also the Gumpo Jyoshu, which the history of the Gumpo Jyoshu corroborates that the Hattori are doing Shinobi things in the 1560s. Okay. We also have the fact that, or also, but keep in mind that just because this may be the first time that somebody created a set of, te uh, a set of, techniques under the heading of shinobi and documented it this does not mean the first time that we can prove shinobi existing history we can show shinobi back in the 1300s we can show the development of shinobi through the 1300s and the 1400s into the 1500s we can show all the different types of spies and scouts and agents and saboteurs that are listed and the systems they go with and how they and how certain systems throughout time begin to blend those terms with the term shinobi, sort of create, like, it's very similar to what I put in my book in Praise of Spies. By the late 1500s and early 1600s, the word shinobi becomes overdefined because so many different roles start to be called shinobi. But primarily we have living spy and saboteur combined into the shinobi. But originally shinobi appears to be a verb where you're sneaking out of a place or it's a noun where you're sabotaging something. So you sneak into a place and set it on fire. Later in the late 1400s, spy, somebody who actually listens and sneaks in and relays information back and forth, that is when that gets tied in with a saboteur. So, some, so a shinobi of the late 1400s might sneak into a place and stay there for months relaying information and then at the end, set something on fire. Yeah. So, and then as the Sengoku period takes place and into the Edo, more and more roles are collapsed into the title of Shinobi. So the Shinobi is way over defined by the Edo people. <coughs> All right, so hopefully you guys have caught up with that and you understand that Shinobi exists. Shinobi, saboteurs, spies, espionage, they all exist pre-1560. There's so much documentation on it. But it's not until 1560 that we have a single system that is all ninja written down in a document that's called Ninja Document. So the first time is 1560. Now that I've said that, I'm going to wander off now in a little bit of tangent. The first thing that I want to say is uh, in his video, Anthony kept saying, iga, 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 iga. but let me, but Anthony, uh, if you watch this video, uh, you, you, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to put this out there. This Hattori Hanzo, who's recording these documents was he, yes, he served Tokugawa, but if he's writing in 1560, especially if he's writing before Ikehaza, Okehazama, that makes him, yes, he's a, a Tokugawa. Well, not, it's not Tokugawa at the time. It's Matsudaira. It makes him a Matsudaira retainer, but more specifically, it makes him an Imagawa retainer. This Hanzo wasn't even born in Iga. He was born in Mikawa. And you mentioned that in your video. 
So technically, this means he's not an Igamono. He would be a Mikawa no Mono. Like, he would be a man of Mikawa. He would also be an Imagawa retainer. And this is, and so now what I'm, now, now what I'm saying is pure conjecture, but I'm putting it out there for, for future posterity. The Imagawa have a well-established tradition of espionage and sabotage. You can find it in, you can look to the Taiheiki to see the Imagawa. The Imagawa settled in Mikawa during the, third, the, during the 1200s, I believe. So the Imagawa are a major powerhouse through the Namboku Sho and into the Sengoku period. So the Imagawa are the like multi, like multi-generational hundreds of years of being the authority of the Mikawa. Mikawa area. We also know from the Taiheiki and also the Baishoron. Now, if you guys don't know what the Baishoron is, the Baishoron is the is Ashikaga Takuiji's. Uh, it's not his personal document, but he he basically. Yeah, okay, let me st let me step up for a second. You have the Taiheiki documents. Okay, Ashikaga Takuiji then was presented with the early version of the Taiheiki. It wasn't. It, it was nowhere near the forty something documents. It was like thirty something documents. He wasn't very pleased with it because he realized that when because the document was being written by monks, mostly monks who were like when a battle was over, the monks were doing prayers for the dead and they were interviewing people to get an idea of what happened at the battle. And these monks eventually pulled all these documents together to create the Taiheiki document. And when he read them, he was not pleased because it really showed him in a bad light. I mean, he did, he, Ashikaga was a bad dude, so of course they showed him in a bad light. He completely scrubbed volume 22, and then he also demanded that the other remaining documents be edited. He also then instructed that the Baishoron, so Baishoron is a, is a, uh, oh, hold on, let me get to that. At this, okay, so he did that, so he wanted the Taihikis edited. Also, at this time, a southern court general wrote a text called Jino Shotoki. The Jino Shotoki, which can be a whole other video, is basically a religious slash military slash history document for the southern court lawyers. It's like part religion, part politics, part military. <clears throat> the Jino Shotoki. So Ashikaga was seeing these sort of taiheikis, he was seeing the Jino Shotoki, and then he was getting kind of upset because he was really being portrayed as a villain. So at some point in all of this, he has the Baishoron created. And the Baishoron is like a shorter taiheiki-ish document written from the perspective to make Ashikaga look like the good guy. So the, the whole thing is written from Ashikaga's perspective making it out, making it look like he's the good, excuse me, making it look like he's the good guy. So, the, in the, by, so that's why, so anyway, that's that document. So you have, then that's what the thing that people need to understand is when you say the Taiheiki document, it's not, when I say, for example, that I'm studying the Taiheiki, I don't mean I'm studying the English translation of the Taiheiki. It means I'm acquiring a dozen different versions of the Taiheiki, 12 or more different Taiheiki documents. I'm also studying the commentaries to the Taiki. I'm also reading and studying the Baishoron. I'm reading and studying the Jino Shoto. So please understand when I say the Taiheki documents, I'm not talking about a single book. I'm talking about 12 or more different versions of the Taiheki, all in Japanese. There's the only English translation of the Taiheki is 12 volumes long. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about 40 plus volumes of Taiheki, 12 or more versions. Taiheiki commentaries, which are not translated in English. The Vaishoron. The list goes on. The Jino Shotoki. The list goes on. So I just please understand, like it's when I say Taiheiki documents, it, I'm talking about a massive amount of documentation. When you look in to the Taiheiki documents, you can see. Anyway, so what why am I saying all this? When you look into the Taiheiki documents, which is everything I've just been talking about. You can see the Imagawa family, the Imagawa, the house of Imagawa. They are big, they are powerful, and they absolutely have spies, and they absolutely have espionage and saboteurs. The Imagawa family also wrote a document called the Nan Taheki. Here we go, here's another Taheki document. Nan Taheki, written in the early 1400s, is the Imagawa family's 
response to the Taiheiki, because in the Taiheiki, the Imagawa are portrayed in a negative light. And so the Imagawa wrote Imaga, uh, non Taiheiki, and non Taiheiki means to go counter to the Taiheiki or to refute it or to have issues with it. So, like the counter to the Taiheiki is non Taiheiki. And the Imagawa family wrote that one. So, there we go. There's an in, in that document is all Imagawa history. So basically they go through the Taiheiki and they point out all the places where they're misrepresented and they give massive amounts of information on what really happened from their perspective. We also know that Imagawa Nyodo in the late 1400s wrote a commentary to the Taiheiki. It's 40 something volumes long, 2000 plus pages, which I've read the thing, studying it, it's amazing, it's awesome. We also know that Imagawa Nyodo wrote two documents that were contained within the, the so Kusunokiru has a branch called Taiheiki in it. And Imagawa Nyodo wrote two of the documents that go into Taiheiki. Okay. So the point is, is we can see some of the, the military history of the, tai, of the Imagawa through their writings, through their Taiheiki documents, but also the Taiheiki commentary and the, the, Kusunoki, the Kusunoki Taihekiru Gunpo manuals also have history, but they also have techniques. So what am I getting at? In the history and the Gunpo of the Imagawa family, which is clearly laid out in historical documentation, we see shinobi. We see spies and saboteurs. We see spies and saboteurs being referred to as shinobi. So, Hattori Hanzo in 1560 is serving under Matsudaira, who would later become Tokugawa. But they are both Imagawa retainers in 1560 at the Battle of Okehazama. The Imagawa family lose the Battle of Okehazama to Oda Nobunaga, Oda Nobuna and the Imagawa clan falls apart. Later, not immediately after, but, but later, Matsudaira makes a, a, a alliance with Oda and becomes an Oda retainer and ends up, as we know, he ends up becoming Tokugawa Ieyasu. But in 1560, they are not Oda retainers yet. They're Imagawa retainers. So we have Hattori Hanzo serving Matsudaira, but they're both Imagawa retainers. So where am I going with this? I am saying that the assumption that it's Iga, I don't think that's a good assumption because he's a retainer to a clan, to a house that has a, has a long and prestigious and powerful history that clearly has shinobi recorded in their history and their gumpo. So the assumption that he got his ninjutsu from Iga is an assumption because he could have easily got it within his service to the Imagawa house because we know the Imagawa house is rock and shinobi from the 1400s. The other thing is, in the shinobi hidden documents, Hattori Hanzo's document, I don't believe they reference Iga one time. In the Shinobi Hidden documents, as a totality, Iga is referenced, but I'm fairly certain it's only referenced in these documents from the 1600s. I am pretty sure that in the, specifically in the 1560 documentations, that Iga is not mentioned once which means that the mentioning of Iga is something that came in the 1600s. Because unless we see Iga clocked right in to Hattori Hanzo's 1560 documents, we can't say definitively that it's Iga. Well, all we can say is Hattori Hanzo, 1560, Shinobi techniques. But he's serving the Imagawa at the time. And we know that they have Shinobi teaching. They don't have any shinobi manuals, but they have shinobi recorded briefly in their gunpo and in their history. So we can assume, we can theorize 
that the material is coming from ego? But we can equally theorize that it's coming from an Imagawa. We also have another history. Now let's go with the Gumpo Joshu. Gumpo Joshu says that the Hattori in 1560-ish, whatever, serving under Takeda Shingen, that he is has ninja arts. And so the potential assumption here is that the Takeda Hattori is studying shinobi arts from the Hattori in Mikawa. It's possible. I don't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that puts the Takeda and the Imagawa at odds with each other at that time period. However, so it is possible. However, we also know that the Takeda were students of the same material that the Imagawa were studying. We know that Koyoru has a basis in, I dare say it, Kusunokiru. There's so we they, we we see another semblance, another another aspect of Kusunokiru even on the Takeda. So we know, for example, that the Takeda already have spies and espionage. But but now here's the thing: we have not shown that Takeda uses the word shinobi. We can only show that Takeda has spies and that Takeda has uh, saboteurs, but we cannot show the word shinobi in Takeda usage. But we can show the word shinobi in the Imagawa prior to 1560. So it is very possible that the Takeda Hattori is studying from the Mikawa Hattori very possible, very possible. But the word shinobi, based on the evidence we have now, the word shinobi would have, in theory, had to come through the Mikawa Hattori. And the Mikawa Hattori, everyone's assuming they got it from Iga, but why are they assuming we got it from, we cannot show shinobi in Iga at all at this time, but we can absolutely show shinobi in the imagawa at this time so from a historical academic perspective i would make the argument that we must be compelled to make the assumption i know it's only a theory so i'm not saying it's truth i'm just saying it's the working theory that hattori the work usage of shinobi would have had to come based on the evidence we have now would have come from the imagawa and i'm going to actually position that it, that, that the usage of the word shinobi was coming from the Imagawa because the Imagawa control the Mikawa area for generations. They are powerful. They have, we've clocked spies, saboteurs, even the usage of the word shinobi from the 1400s in the clan in Mikawa. So if Hattori Hanzo is writing shinobi this, shinobi this, it's more likely, I feel it's more feasible to presume He's getting that information from Mikawa, not that he's running all the way back to Iga and getting the information in Iga, because again, we have a problem. We can't show it in Iga, but we can show it in Imagawa. So that's kind of, so again, all right, so in wrapping up, one, Hattori and Tokugawa, who's a Matsudaira at the time. So Matsudaira and Hattori are serving the Imagawa in the 1560s. We know that the Imagawa have a well-recorded military history, and we see the word shinobi appearing in their history and in their gunpo. We also know that we don't see any evidence for shinobi and Iga at the time, and the uh, Hattori Hanzo's 1560 documents do not reference Iga. So these four points compel us to assume, as a theory, in my mind, it's reasonable, that the the word shinobi is coming from the Imagawa, not from Iga. Now, is it possible that Hattori Hanzo is getting some techniques from Iga? I mean, throw your hands up. I mean, yeah, I guess it may be possible, but we can show a history of spying and sabotage with the word shinobi coming from the Imagawa. So, and he's an Imagawa retainer. So, it's... We, we, we have to follow where the evidence takes us. So, in a nut, so this is 40 minutes in, so let me wrap this up. Okay, so point one, 1560 document, first, uh, first case of Shinobi 
no jutsu or you know a ninja art in one singular system 1560 Atari Hanzo corroborated by other documentation that was Anthony's view and now what I'm adding to that is I postulate that the shinobi arts uh, that we're seeing are not coming from Iga but that they're coming from the Imagawa which they serve all right, guys, if you have any questions or comments, you can feel free to contact me. If you know how to get me on Facebook, I check it once in a while. You can put comments in the section below. Uh, if you have want to do response videos, if you want to call me an idiot or you think I have a good idea, whichever is fine. I just want this video is to stimulate your conceptual and critical, your, stimulate your critical thinking about this topic. Don't just sort of blindly follow like, you know, what what has been written in pre by previous Japanese historians. There's been a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. I have documents which people like, for example, there are two Taiheki commentaries. And for, uh, for a long time, Japanese professors believed that they were the same document. And it turns out that they are two distinctly do different documents with completely different histories there's nothing about them that's the same, but for some reason, Japanese historians believe they were the same document. I mean, there has been some serious mistakes made, and we, because uh, there's actually, well, this is an entire different video, I won't go into it, but there's a good explanation as to why there's been sort of these mistakes, but I won't go into that in the video. But what I want is, guys, think critically about things. Every, you need to look at the entire thing and break it down into its constituent parts and examine each constituent part. You know, because something may be fully true, something may be half true. You've got to figure out what parts, which parts hold up to investigation and which parts fall off. And then from the parts that hold up to investigations, you can see where they corroborate and linked to get a more correct, wider version of the story. So if nothing else, let this video spark your creative thinking and your investigative thinking and your refined, your refined view, your discernment about dates and times and what's rational and what's logical and what makes sense and what doesn't. And be very, uh, it's very, very easy to just kind of, you know, follow what everyone's saying. Like for example, Hattori Hanzo uh, is Iga. Oh no, his document isn't from the 1600s or 1500s. No, 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 no. The, a lot of people talk a lot of stuff, guys. But discernment, rational, correct procedural thinking is the clarity will bring you to a place of what is true and what is false. So if anything, if nothing else, at least hopefully this video stimulates your discernment. All right, guys, take care.